This morning, I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Paul Dolan from the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science, who probably needs no introduction, which is lucky because I don't have much time to list all the things that he's done. Um, but suffice to say, he's dedicated his career to improving the well-being of the world. And um, today he's going to be talking about a partnership with COA Health, formerly Alpha Telefonica, over the last five years to deliver digital mental health services. Um, unfortunately, Alexander Matic from COA Health um, wasn't able to attend in the end, but Paul has kindly agreed to go ahead and also share Alexander's reflections from the corporate perspective. So at the end of the session, we will have time for some questions, which we'll take via the chat. So please do be thinking about those whilst Paul is talking. But for now, I will hand over to Paul uh, for his reflections on the partnership. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much, Louise, and thank you everyone for joining. That was a nice introduction. I've devoted a lifetime to improving well-being. That's how that makes, it, makes, it makes me sound very grand. I, I, um, uh, I like that. I don't know how much of it's true, but anyway, let's let's uh, say that all of it is. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as you said, unfortunately, Alex can't be here today. So he sent me some bullet points on what he was going to say. Um, I won't do it in his Serbian accent, unfortunately, um, but I will do him justice I hope and it will and it will necessarily be quicker than he would have said it himself um so we will we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end so please do take the opportunity to have a conversation with me because that's really what all these sessions are about really is having a conversation um so what I was going to do anyway was to go back to the beginning and um talk about the relationship with what was then Alpha which was a moonshot of Telefonica I don't know if many know these things, but you know these big these big companies, particularly the telecommunications companies, whatever, have these moonshots, they call them, where they invest resource in um, smaller entities, essentially, to try to create innovative solutions to the problems that the world faces. And, you know, in the case of telecoms, their traditional routes to market through text messages and phone calls have obviously diminished significantly over the last, you know, few years. And so they're looking for other ways of creating revenue streams, frankly. And so they invest in these smaller enterprises and entities, and they all kind of have a go at trying to do something exciting and, um, and see where it goes and hopefully create some revenues and returns. And so I, it is about five or six years ago, I can't remember the exact dates, but about, about that long ago, roughly speaking, um, I was approached by then the CEO of Alpha um, to be involved in their endeavors and their activities which as louise alluded to in the introduction was to create digital uh, mental health platforms apps offers that would that would that would, in, that, that would enhance people's mental health and well-being through digital platforms um digital technologies from people with clinical diagnoses of conditions so um alex may have spoken more broadly about some of the stuff that uh, alpha and and now COA, as, as they are now, um, have been doing. Um, I've been less less involved in that. I've been working with quite a few psychiatrists, in particular in North America, to develop digital platforms that would enable people to essentially access mental health mental health services virtually and digitally, rather than always having to see their clinician. And they've shown some effects of some of those interventions quite nicely. Um, and of course, they're they're they are potentially for clinical populations in particular, incredibly cost-effective ways of delivering services. Um, also in subclinical populations, so people who will at some stage soon or soonish may well potentially go on to develop the clinical diagnosis of depression, anxiety, whatever. Um, and also with general populations. And that's kind of where most of my uh, work with, with Alpha and now COA have been has been located in how can you sort of improve the mental health and well-being of people who don't have a clinical diagnosis and might not get one anytime soon because that's kind of as as Louis said that is actually you know, sort of joking and uh, facetious as to one side that has been a lifetime ambition of mine is to try and find ways in which we can improve the well-being and welfare of large populations with relatively cost-effective interventions and of course digital platforms and mental health offer, offer you know, Digital mental health offers one of many ways in which we might go about doing that. So I've had association with 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 Alpha and Alcoa for for those half a dozen years. We've engaged in a 
in a whole range of activities. Um, just we started actually uh, the very first project we did was on um, cognitive bias modification and related in relation to alcohol consumption. There's some evidence that uh, when people engage in um, tasks where they are essentially required to, you do these over a course of a series of days, only about like 15 minutes or so a day, where you literally have a joystick or the cursors or keys on your laptop, joysticks work better. You literally push away images of alcohol and you pull towards yourself images of soft drinks. And that essentially, to put this in, in very crude terms that neuroscientists would hate me saying, rewires your brain to be less drawn towards alcohol. Because all of our behaviours, including alcohol consumption, have a series of antecedent behaviours that lead to the behaviour in itself. You don't suddenly have a drink in your hand. There's a whole series of steps that lead you to having a drink in your hand, the first of which are cues in your environment that activate your mind and your eyes, unconsciously often in many ways, oftentimes, towards those kind of signals and cues and triggers that end up with you drinking or doing whatever it is that you engage in that you might not otherwise want to. So that actually was quite, that was a reasonably successful pilot that we did with them. And we moved on to do a whole host of other things with them over the last last five or six years, culminating where I'm going to pay my attention in, in, in a moment, which is what Alex would have talked more in more detail about. Um, but, but, bef but before I get there, I just wanted to give a, a couple of reflections, I think, which will be shared reflections, I think, that Alex and I would have on the relationships between academics and industry. I think it's kind of worth just spending a couple of moments on that before I say a little bit more about the details of the study that we were particularly involved with. There are two um, app-based studies that we were involved in with the LSE, that I work with the LSE and um, COA to develop. Um, and <laughs> the first thing, which is, I kind of, it seems a very obvious thing to say, but it's not obvious to some academics in my experience, is that you get some really good and nice people working in the private sector as much as you do in the public sector. This idea, this kind of sort of notion that you get a selection bias into people who want to do good and, you know, produce pro-social returns in whatever way you might want to measure that, you know, work in universities and the public sector and all those nasty, horrible people that want to make money uh, and accumulate profits and assets work in the private sector. And, um, of course, that is plainly untrue. And... Mostly what is true is that most people, whether they work in the public or private sectors, actually want to go to work to do some good. They're motivated, if not always explicitly, but implicitly by concerns in some sense for social welfare, however that might be defined and measured. So I think that's a very, that's an, that's, I think that's a very important lesson because I have met in, 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 in the last half dozen years some resistance some from some academics and it's true that it's not many i don't want to i don't want to overemphasize this or overdo it who kind of think that working with business in the industry is a bit like working with the devil um and uh i just want to dispel spell that myth very very clearly and if alex were here he would be able to do that just simply by dint of his personality and his nature and his temperament having come from a research and academic background in the first place and i guess that segues into the next observation is that the best collaborations are ones where you, where you, where you do have some sort of overlapping regards and interests. And one of the things that Alpha were very, very keen to do from the beginning. Actually, one of the reasons why. So, going backwards a second. I mean, I have had opportunity, uh, or, you know, offers to work with lots of companies and digital platforms and so on over the last decade or more. And I've mostly turned those down because they have typically been models based on generating returns from advertising revenues and so on. Whereas Alpha and Co have been uh, based on more of a subscription model. And I kind of quite like that because it's a much more honest way to engage with people, right? So I pay £10 a month for Spotify Premium. I pay that directly to Spotify for the service that they give me. So it was a much more honest transaction, much more... I don't know if it's ethical is quite the right word, but maybe ethical, uh, a, a more ethical transaction than being bombarded with lots of advertising that I don't, uh, to buy stuff that I don't need. So I think there's been that shared ambition. There's also the shared, there, there is the fact that many of them have worked in research before, I think is a good way to help create conversations and, you know, sort of dialogue and make those conversations easier. The fact that they always wanted to put evidence and science at the heart of their offer, that was a, a branding thing. 
a sort of USP of what color would like to do is to, is to put evidence at the, at, the, at the heart of what they do. Um, and that, of course, has commercial returns to it. There's no like there's no reason why these things can't be win wins. And I think that's, a again, a really important observation that there's not always trade offs between, you know, doing good and making money. Sometimes those those two things go hand in hand. And actually, we probably get the best. The best of all worlds when those when those things do go do go hand in hand. Um, having said that, there have been some points of departure. And one of the things that's really interesting is some of the language that's used in different disciplines. I mean, we all we all know this from an academic world, let alone across public and private sectors. And one of the lessons that we we've learned, I think, and I'm constantly learning, it's never it's never a lesson learned. I think if you feel like you know, you've reached the point where you know everything, you're a fool. Um, is that we we have you know, come to understand how even what we might mean by hypothesis <laughs> would be a different thing for them. That would often mean rationale for a study, which to an academic is something different. Or the way that we approach analysis of data, these companies uh, adopt much more of a sort of data mining, machine learning type approach, which is very atheoretical. Social scientists often pull their hair out of some of those methods because they have no theory that underpins what they're trying to predict. So. That's been a really that's been a really nice and I think in many ways healthy tension, but there is a tension there, none the none the uh, less. It's it's worth it's worth being honest about that and open about that and uh, realizing that some of that does require effort in order to kind of you know work our way through those tensions and to um, uh, engage in some of these partnerships for over, over the sort of longer term because it does then enable does then enable you to uh, to uh, to. To, to you know, sort of work your way through as far as possible, those um, tensions. Uh, and the other thing, the final thing, is worth you. It, it, you might expect a happiness professor to say this, but, the, but one of the one of the important points is to have fun along the way. I will always absolutely remind anybody who's engaging in any collaboration or any working relationship or anything that they do in life. It's got to feel like it's either pleasurable and or purposeful. Um, and if it's neither of those things, then um, I don't think the collaboration is going to be successful. Um, I think we we underestimate the importance of enjoyment and fun in our lives generally, but particularly in work lives when we're thinking about strategies and achievements and outcomes. Let's not forget that the journey towards those destinations needs to be enjoyable. Um, and, and one of the great my collaboration with Kara, I think, has been that we've all had a good time and we've got on very well. Very well. Let me then just let me then just take um, five minutes or so to outline what, more of what Alex would have would have said were he were he here. Um, it's kind of unfortunate. I actually generally one of the one of one of my sources of fun is taking the piss out of people, and I, it's much more fun when they're there and can witness witness me doing it. It feels a bit disingenuous to do it behind his back, so I won't. I won't do that. So many opportunities for humour have been lost by Alex's absence. Um, one of the things that we have done um, twice now is do uh, two app-based studies with LSE students. A few staff were in the original study, but, but hardly any that we focused our attention on the student population. What we did is we did a few, a few hundred people. Alex may have put some slides. I don't think there's time to do slides today, but we had a few hundred people in each of two studies that were done pre and post COVID. And basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted to test the limits, really, frankly, of what you could ask people to do. So we were asking them <laughs> fucking loads and loads of happiness questions over the course of about two or three weeks, um, to the point at which some of them would have got seriously pissed off we, we 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 actually just offered them a 20 quid amazon voucher so it wasn't like they were doing it for any uh, any financial motivation or any financial gain they were just uh, remarkably compliant or or i don't know just wanted to please the research team or something i have no idea but students are extraordinarily compliant um danny kahneman who, who, who some of you may 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 know the nobel prize winner i worked with in princeton a couple of decades ago now nearly um we we have we've had various conversations with him about some of the work work that we've been doing, and he he's naturally pessimistic by uh, nature, and he was like, "You're never going to get away. You're, you're no one's going to be answering this many questions over this long." And we we're like, "Okay, well, we'll well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how far we can push people." And actually, you know, we obviously had some people drop out, but we managed to keep a few hundred people with us 
for two or three weeks, I think, three weeks in the case of the first 32 weeks and the second, so answering questions, lots of questions every day about, about what they were do, doing, who they were with, how they were feeling, and what they were thinking about. That's been one of the things that we've really um, uh, focused our attention on. I have a couple of PhD students that are working over these data now, where we've been looking at um, the thoughts that people uh, have when they're doing the things they do. Most of our time, you'll all be familiar with this, most of the time that you're engaged in tasks, even listening to me for the last 15 minutes, there's been moments when your mind has wandered elsewhere um, to better places, sometimes to worse places, <laughs> sometimes to anywhere else other than having to listen to me. Um, and uh, so a significant uh, portion of our time is spent in um, paying attention to, not the, to, 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 to things other than the activities that we're engaged in. And we have very little good data on so that we have very little good naturally occurring data um, on on what those thoughts are. Often the the stuff on rumination or intrusive thoughts they're sometimes called um, is in the clinical populations for people that ruminate or think about things a lot. So they're in clinical populations precisely because they do that. Um, we have we have very few studies, if any, really that have properly looked at um, those kinds of ruminations and those thoughts um, in naturally occurring environments and in general population. So we have quite a lot of data on that that we're looking at. For those of you that are interested, one thing that one of the, one of the PhD students is looking at at the moment is, um, just as a quick aside, is how much your mind wanders when you're with different types of people. Like, so when you're on your own, when you're with, when you're with family and friends, when you're with uh, you know, colleagues or whatever, um, your mind wanders most of all when you're with your partner, which I thought was quite, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, I guess, I mean, you can, we can speak, like, let's not go into, Let's not let's not spend much more time discussing that. But I'm sure you've got your own reasons why, when you're with your spouse, you're not really paying very much attention to them. Uh, so anyway, so that's the kind of that's the, these these are the sorts of data that we're uh, able to generate. One of the things that we 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 were lucky enough to do, although this is clearly not you know, there's all sorts of contamination effects in what we've done. But having done it pre-COVID and post-COVID, we've kind of got some comparison between the two um, samples, insofar as it's possible to make those comparisons, and so we can see what you know, online learning does to people and we're in the process of exploring those data a bit more, a bit more fully. Um, one of the things that Alex would be, I'd be remiss in saying uh, that Alex would say is that we, we had a, an app, a, a, a you know, digital app that, um, that uh, Cora have developed called uh, Foundations. It now was Reflections, I think, but the app's now called Foundations. And we built that into the, the, the most recent study uh, with the LSE, and we randomised whether people got 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 the app or got some kind of sort of sham like you know condition that was similar but not the app. Um, and there was there has been some significant reduction in anxiety. Uh, interestingly, not not in the positive statements of happiness, but in the negative statements of anxiety um, in the treatment group as compared to the control group. So it looks like there may be some. Um, significant but you know, margin, you know marginal but significant effect of the use of this app in um, general populations that um, you know samples so that's kind of that's kind of where we are I think that's uh, I did actually you always, you always end up speaking for longer than you anticipate but that's I think that's fine um, so that's kind of I think everything um, that I wanted to say um, uh, I hope I've done I hope I've done our collaboration justice and maybe there's a few points that people want to pick up on yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, any questions, please do write them in the chat. Um, I'll just start by asking what's what's next for the partnership. Um, it's, a really good, it's a really good question. I thought about saying that at the end, but because I didn't know what to say, I decided to stop before saying it. Um, so so I think I think it's I think it's I think you know for that for Alpha were in the privileged position of having Telefonica's money behind them to, to begin with. They've now had to raise, you know, money on markets, uh, and hence they're co and now and not alpha. So they are focused much, much more now on the on the sales side of things than they are on the research side of things that I've been involved in more, more, more fully over the recent years. So I think, I think for them it is about getting apps like foundations and stuff out there and used, and you know, used, used particularly in work places. They want to get stuff into employer benefit schemes, all those kinds of things. Um, for me, I guess it's, it's an interesting question. I am, I am, from a from a sort of measurement perspective, because that's one of the things I'm most interested in is how you measure 
happiness and well-being. And one of the things I've, I've said over many years now in various ways is I'd love to find out how happy people are without asking. Because the moment you the moment you ask someone a question about their well-being, you've got a reactivity effect, right? You've you've stopped them in what they're doing. They think about the question, they answer it. How much that is a useful guide to their well-being, if only you weren't asking them it, is an open question. So I'm interested in how the technologies can be used to gather passive data that might might inform um, well-being. So we've got we we do, for example, have ambient noise, you know, background noise and whatever in. Uh, in these studies, I want, I want to look a bit more about whether, you know, people's well-being is affected by how noisy the backgrounds are and what's around them. Um, I'd like to get much more into these thoughts, things. I'd like to get into conversations. Actually, that I, I, I realise, I realise nothing, nothing new in saying this. That actually a lot of lot of our well-being is 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 created and generated and experienced in the conversations that we have with people about things. One of the reasons why. Um, the evidence shows that you know people get are happier when they spend money on experiences than on material consumption, and the main reason for that is because we can talk about a festival that we went to forever. Talking about a new pair of shoes turns you into a bit of a dick quite quickly. So um, I think I'd like to I'd like to think of ways in which we can uh, uh, more organically and naturally pick up the well being associated with conversations. Okay, great. Uh, question in the chat. Would you mind saying a bit more about the apps? Are you developing more than one app together for different population groups? And will you continue to be involved in measuring the impact of foundations? Yes, thank you. Um, that's a good question. I So I think, as I say, COA are, 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 you know, I've got lots of, you know, kind of, I suppose, incentive really to, to get foundations out there and used more widely across populations as i say there are there are different populations of different technologies and different apps and platforms being used for i have much less involvement in the clinical population as i said at the beginning because they're working directly with psychiatrists on those um interventions there's some clinical populations are interesting because they're the ones that you can really probably make you know arguably have the most impact upon because you can stop them becoming clinical and then you know uh, both being less happy in every measurable sense but also uh, generating less resource use as a result of it so i kind of like to get i think i'd like to get more involved in, in the subclinical populations um but i think one of the things that we learn that we're learning all the time is that you would need different apps and different interventions for different people and understanding more about that personalization um, i think is really important not just to, not just across the clinical diagnosis spectrum but across personality type for for example uh, one of my other phd students is looking at um the role of personality as a mediating variable in the effectiveness of different interventions uh, so i'd like to um yeah i'd like to get more into that and actually as because my wife is a psychotherapist and is obsessed with uh, with attachment styles as all psychotherapists are um, i'd like to actually do more research on the role of attachment styles and and, and and how people respond to different interventions thank you um a question from sarah anderson on you talked about um earlier the resistance that some academics have to working with corporates and yeah. she says, what more can we do to persuade colleagues that there are some real advantages to engaging with them so it's a very good question. It, it depends. I mean, there will always be there will always be those academics who are just not interested, like, who are just up to, or disinterested, uninterested in impact, who just want to do research for research sake, and are quite happy doing that. And there is a place for that. I think it's a small place. I don't think it's a very big place. I don't think we should indulge <laughs> people too much in doing things for the sake of it, but. Um, there's a there's a small place for that perhaps, but I think increasingly and particularly as incentives in academia are now becoming increasingly clearer in relation to impact. Right, we have impact case studies for the ref. We have um, the research councils have longer and longer sections on impact. Um, I think maybe that's where we can convince, insofar as we need to sell it to academics, that that's where you're uh, where 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 you can do well by partnerships um, and working through partnerships is you can have reach. And you can have impact in ways that you could only dream of in your narrow academic ivory tower. Yeah, agreed. Um, Horatio says, it sounds like it might really help people. Is it very cynical to ask whether you think Telefonica's motivation was to counter some of the popular notions 
that mobile phones are bad for mental well-being? I know it's a good question. I've always I'm I'm kind of always alert to the hypocrisy or the irony or whatever the word is. It's not a good word anyway about using mobile devices to improve well-being when by and large mo those mobile uh, are, are, are making are making people less happy. The more time we spend on our phones, the less good it is for us. So I, I'm always trying to think, and uh, sometimes I forget this, but it's good to be reminded of it that whatever we do we are actually trying to encourage people to do things in the real world i think uh we can use mobile technologies as a as a as a catalyst for real world engagement but never as a substitute um and i think there is a limit i think you know I mean, we, we can get caught up in the technology and how exciting it is to be able to do these things but actually realize that we want to get people away from their phones and away from their desks and, and out into the real world and, and to actually just have real experiences with real people. Um, so I think that's that's just a reminder um, that we need to do that and always keep that in mind, I think. Thank you. And time for one more question. You may not know the answer to this, but perhaps from your own personal opinion, would you be deterred more by creating a spin out compared to it being licensed, which requires less commercial involvement? I guess this is the sort of thing that's off putting to academics to me. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, well, I don't know. I mean, I think anything that anything that reduces transactions costs is going to be is going to be helpful. You realise that working with, you know, working with organisations, working with entities of any kind, um, institutions like the LSE, you know, even companies like Alpha that were in Telefonica, it's less of a challenge now with COA, creates treat, you know, sort of bureaucratic treacle um, that that needs to be waded through and and anything that we can do to smooth the ways in which these uh, activities can be carried out will be helpful i mean that is one thing about you know i have said many times that I, I like being academic i don't like academics very much it's, but by and large true um but uh but one of the things that i do like is we do you know there is a there is a there is a kind of desire to get things done and to do you know and to kind of you know not have to do go through too many hoops play too many games you know act in too much of a strategic way in order to accomplish your academic ambitions and and i think uh anything that we can do to facilitate that for academics i think would be would be helpful so i don't know whether whether it's an answer to the question but i think it's whether it's a spin out whether it's licensed whether however it looks is just make it easy. I mean, that's a simple behavioral science one one lesson. If you want, if you want someone to do something or you want to do something, make it easy. Um, and I think that's kind of quite a nice place on which to end. Make it easy. 